Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming in again. Uh, like Luis introduced me, I'm uh, Mark Betchel, Senior Herpetologist at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. I've been at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens for over 15 years, almost 16 now, and stumbled my way into uh, striped newt conservation. So the uh, striped newt Adults are so adults are tan are brown, and they lack also blue. There's your typical adult female straight. And photo group in case you didn't believe. In the breeding season, we have large kittens, which are used to court females, and black ridges or pads on their inner thighs and toes that aid giraffes females during their And by using Typical man's right new with the enlarged tail fin, and uh, this is where it helps if you were here. And I had a laser pointer to show you all the little darker spots on his toes, but you can see it looks like the tips of his toes are actually kind of black. Larvae are yellow to olive colored with a dark stripe from the snout through the eye to the gill, and uh, dark stripes along each side of their body. These are newly hatched. Larvae and uh, there's an unhatched egg right next to that one in the center of the photo. This is approximately a six week old larva. Larvae can develop into Fs, which is the terrestrial stage of the striped newt, in as little as three months. But they often take longer. This phase may be skipped. And newts will turn into pomorphic gilled adults if their wetlands do not dry seasonally. So don't get the two amplexing there. Uh, look at the one to the right. You can actually see that that one, it's an adult newt. It's a breeding age newt, but you can actually still see the gills present. <clears throat> so a little bit of history. Striped newts. They're listed as near threatened by the IUCN. They're currently broken down, in, broken down into two distinct genetic variants or clades, Eastern and Western. The Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens initially obtained striped newts in 2007. They're the Eastern clade striped newts originally. They started breeding within months of uh, coming out of our, our zoo quarantine. We produced about 400 offspring between 2008 and 2012, which sounds like a lot, but it's not, and I'll get to that later. But uh, during that time, we learned how not to keep striped newts alive. I can tell you all the different ways that I failed. Um, then we'd need more than 50 minutes, though. But uh, we eventually figured it out. So the Eastern clade, or Eastern haplogroup, as they're now known, while in decline, are still found throughout much of their historic range. Populations are very removed from one another, though, so there's very little, um, very little uh, genetic drift in there. So that is a potential problem for the future. So in 2012, we shipped out our remaining adults and juveniles to make room for the rare Western haplogroup. Four of them were donated from uh, U.S. Geological Service. And, and all these animals were from the fall line sand hills in Taylor County, Georgia. Shortly after their arrival, breeding behaviors were observed. Again, newts typically go at it pretty well. They do pretty well in captivity. And in early 2013, we received an additional four from the Memphis Zoo. <clears throat> One of the strongholds, getting into some of the problems here, for the western haplogroup had been the Apalachicola National Forest. Multiple surveys over the course of several decades failed to yield any presence of newts within the Apalachicola National Forest, uh, suggested a local extirpation of the species. While there's no smoking gun pointing towards their decline, 
there's a lot of factors. Um, and I know everybody can read all this stuff, but well, you're listening to me talk, so why not? So a natural gas line was expanded through the months in the sand hills, and uh, that caused a lot of habitat loss and fragmentation. Increased pressure on the aquifer by nearby Tallahassee. A lot more people moving to Florida every day, and uh, they need water to drink and water their lawns and things like that. Much of the native habitat surrounding protected areas had been lost to development. There's been a long drought cycle throughout much of the southeastern U.S. There's a potential pathogenic cause for decline. Rana virus had been found in several wetlands within the a and and uh, prescribed burning and fire suppression is a major factor with a lot of amphibian decline within the southeast, especially. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, Smoky Bear did not do us any favors. Um, the reason being that fires are suppressed during the peak fire season. Here we have, in, in at least the southeast history, like Florida history especially, we have about a two-year burn cycle. Every two years, on average, we would have huge fires ignited in July and August by lightning. And um, during that time, the wetlands where these newts would breed were dry. Well, when uh, these fires are suppressed now, when there's a lightning strike, they come out and put it out. Those summertime fires are dangerous. Instead, they do prescribed burning in the wintertime, which is easier to control, maintain, cool the temperatures, all that, however, that's when all of the adult newts are moving over land to their breeding sites. Additionally, when they do burn during the winter and those ponds are now full, those infernal pools where they breed are now full of water, it's not burning to the center of them. So any trees, saplings, seedlings that may be coming up within the center of those areas aren't burned. So you eventually get this low lying area, which is a pond in the winter time, but just a basin, an empty basin in the summer, it just becomes more wet woodland. And that's not good. <clears throat> so the solution that we came up with, um, well, I should say Ryan Means came up with. He is the wildlife ecologist and director of the Coastal Plains Institute. He began a five-year cost share agreement with the U.S. Forest Service. And um, Opportunistic trees and shrubs encroaching into wetlands were removed or girdled. Um, if they were causing an immediate encroachment into the wetland, they were removed. Otherwise, they were girdled because that they'll eventually die and produce lots of additional habitat and places for animals to hide. So, good to leave them. Some wetlands were fitted with EPDM, synthetic liners, to prevent total water loss during the drought. These were uh, 40 feet by 40 feet and 45 mil thickness. And you can see where they're purchased from, pondminer.com. I am not affiliated whatsoever, so yeah. Uh, partnering with Jacksonville and Memphis, a plan was to a plan to repatriate the striped newts was conceived. So drift fences with pitfall traps were placed around several of these wetlands, designated as release sites to capture any newts leaving or returning to the pond. So you can see the range map of the striped newt, which I apologize. I, this is not my most recent, um, not my most recent file on this. I've cleaned it up a bit since then, and this should have been earlier in. But uh, this is the the state of Florida and Georgia, so you can see where striped newts are found. And uh, that line right down the middle there, that black and white dotted line, that uh, separates the eastern and western clades or haplogroups. groups. So this is a, a picture of the Munson Sandhills region. You can see where historic striped newt breeding wetlands are at and uh, versus all of the ephemeral wetlands. And this is a close-up of where the release ponds were. So you can see we, we decided on four ponds. <clears throat> so this is a photo of a typical ephemeral, ephemeral wetland. And I'll show you how uh, how they did the EPDM liner with these next several slides. Uh, this is just what it looks like in the summertime. Not much. So they they use the tractor to carefully take down about 18 inches of the uh, first top layer. They set it all out like puzzle pieces so that they could put it back. Once they uh, 
and I part, I'm sorry for the pun with the, at the top. I'm, I try to be funny. I typically fail. <laughs> Once they got this 40 foot by 40 foot section squared away, they, uh, they got a little divot in the middle. You can see the liner there. They backfill it in and then carefully put all these pieces back. This is what it looked like when it was done. Doesn't look like much. It looks like a lot of well, devastation, but this is what it looked like the next year. It was hard to tell that there was ever that much, that much destruction going on. So Mother Nature has a great way of uh, making these look great again. So there were some additional benefits of extending the hydro period. Of course, frogs doing their thing. We've got the uh, gopher frogs, big old tadpoles there, mole salamanders. So, and then uh, Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens has tried to play a, as big a role as we can since we are somewhat local. We go out and help out with uh, installation and deconstruction of the drift fences every year. So, this is drift fence insulation. Long, long sheet of uh, metal just encircling the entire wetland, and then we put pitfall traps. We dig uh, holes for the buckets on either side of the fence. Here's the drift fence stump once we got it all installed. There you can see the pitfall traps, the buckets on either side. And I'm actually doing some work there instead of just taking pictures, just to prove. <clears throat> Any of the newts that we release back to the wild now, we release as adults. We started releasing larvae, but it was it's a lot easier to re release them as adults because they're already ready to breed. So you get immediate breeding of, of uh, release newts back in the wetland. And so it's just more bang for your buck. By releasing these adults, at least young adult newts, we can um, implant them with these VIE tags. So they're anesthetized, they're injected with these VIE markers, a visual implanted elastomer, sorry for those playing at home, dilute the newt down to wake it up, and then that's what these elastomers look like. There's a, a kind of a pink one behind the uh, right front leg and a green one just in front of the right rear leg. And the really cool thing is they fluoresce under black light. So you can easily see these newts, uh, at least if they have these VIEs, and then you can tell where they were released from, so which zoo or aquarium was a participating producer of the newts, uh, to see what wetland they were released in. The, each one gets individual markings, so we can always tell them apart. <clears throat> that way we can tell if newts are moving from one wetland to another, if newts uh, have higher survivability rates from Jacksonville versus Central Florida or any of these other places that participate as well. So, getting back into some problems and risks. Disease was a major factor in the pen potential success or failure of this project. Uh, BD or chytrid fungus has not been identified within the ANF, although ronavirus has been found. Jacksonville newts were tested for diseases several times, and still are. Uh, adults during quarantine process and several random larvae are swabbed periodically. So Jacksonville striped newt larvae were sent to the University of Tennessee for ronavirus testing. Larvae are relatively resistant. Mortality is very low. Metamorphs, however, have a much higher mortality rate when exposed to ronavirus. So if they're exposed as larvae, not a big deal, but if they get exposed as metamorphic newts, you can have a bit more problems. So another reason to hold on to them until they're adults just made more sense because the adults didn't seem to have much of a problem with it either. It's that transitionary period when they're trying to absorb their gills and going from breathing dissolved oxygen to actual oxygen. It's a lot of stress on the system. So again, the decision was made to only release newts and wetlands with a hyper period less than nine months because it's less likely to have ronavirus present. There are some wetlands within the ANF that seem to hold water year-round. These 
are great wetlands. However, they also typically have bullfrogs around, and bullfrogs are a known carrier of ronavirus. So here's some of the testing that they were doing for ronavirus. And then this is a newt that returned to the wetland. I know we already saw this slide, but it's a cute picture of us violating this poor newt. <laughs> he was returning to the Apalachicola National Forest, one of the ones we released, and uh, getting all kinds of slobs because they're tested as well. <clears throat> some more problems. Some weather we're having. Too little rain has been a big issue for a long time. We've been in a long drought cycle. No rain means dry ponds, and we can't release newts. So if it's the winter time when we typically have our seasonal rains, then and we don't have them, we can't release them. Temperatures aren't always conducive to newt release or shipment. Too hot, too cold. And then you get too much rain on occasion, and sampling is thrown out the window. So if you look closely at the bottom of this picture, you can see the drift fence and the buckets under the water. Uh, we actually got some great results this year in some of the wetlands that we released newts in. Uh, this wasn't one of them <laughs> because, uh, yeah, everything flooded. So you had newts on either side of the fence that may have just left at any time. So fire ants are another big risk. In uh, 2015, a researcher found a metamorphosed newt at the end, edge of one of the wetlands that was being attacked by fire ants. This animal was transported to Pearson Hill with Florida Fish and Wildlife Committee for evaluation, but later died. He had some, uh, it's tough to see the fire ant bites on him now and or stings on him now, but um, this is what it looked like post-mortem. You can see some pretty severe tissue damage on such a small animal. Some strange lesions have been found on some newts that could be fire ants. This is a newt that uh, has a pretty large lesion for the size of this animal. It was a returning newt coming back for breeding. Uh, it was kept for several weeks and this, this wound site actually healed just fine, and the newt was released back to do his business. And then, uh, some sudden death of captive animals in two enclosures. Five captive newts housed in two locations were found deceased within two weeks of one another. Reasons for those are yet unknown. However, I'll get into that a little bit more later in this, uh, in this program. Stay tuned. So, how we do it. So all the water in the building for use on animals goes through an RO system, uh, reverse osmosis filtration, uh, water softener and carbon filter stored in a 200 gallon tank. Uh, if you're nerdy like I am and just want pictures of filters, there you go. You're welcome. So you've got the, the carbon filter, the resin chamber, the water softener all down there on the floor to the center right. And then the pre-filter and the two additional carbon filters hanging up on the wall before it goes through the reverse osmosis filter all, all the way up at the top. Here are our tanks. The top tank is a 200 gallon tank where the RO water is stored. We drain that down to the bottom tank and reconstitute it. Uh, we use C-chem chemicals, uh, acid buffer, alkaline buffer, and um, right now we're using um, replenish to uh, add minerals back to it. And then that's plumbed via a booster pump down there at the bottom of the uh, thing there to go into the two side rooms that provides water on demand. As soon as you turn on the valve, the booster pump kicks on pretty often. There you go. There's Seacamp products for you. Not very exciting there. So we test water in all our systems weekly, and a 30% or more water change is done every week. Tanks themselves are spot clean, weekly or as needed. And close the furniture to change at least once per month. All newts are held in a relatively biosecure room. Um, complete biosecurity is difficult to attain. It's more difficult when you're nonprofit. So they share this space with uh, native nectar species. Although they have their own dedicated systems, there's no sharing of water tools or anything. And all animals are screened for disease previously and all the flaws typically once a year. 
We base our main enclosure design on Omaha's tried and true design. That's Henry Dorley. Heavy duty racks for 22 gallon Rubbermaid food storage containers. They're drilled with bulkheads and plumbed with uh, supply lines and a drain. There you go. That's what it looks like in my room. Kind of, you got to kind of suck in that, get to get in there and, and work on things or risk catching yourself on the valves. So everything drains through a 100 micron bag filter, and there it goes to the sump and biological media. It goes across the drop in chiller, and it's seasonally adjusted. Actually, now it's seasonally adjusted from 45 degrees in the winter to 76 in the uh, summer. There you go. There's your chiller, your sump. It also goes to a 20 micron filter and UV sterilizer. There you go before going back in the tank. So, temperature and light cycle are important factors in breeding striped newts and a lot of animals. Water level can also play an important role. At uh, Jacksonville, we start lowering water temperatures starting in October. We start raising them again in March. Ambient room temperatures are also adjusted from 75 to 64 in the winter, only because my AC unit won't go below that. An additional chiller was purchased for the larval tanks. This allows us to release animals much sooner than usual as water temperatures in the ephemeral wetlands in January and February are much lower than we could reach without it. Overhead lighting is seasonally adjusted from 10 to 14 hours to 13 11. Additionally, the room has skylights which allow natural light cycles because nobody can do it better than Mother Nature. Water level can be manipulated as well, lowering water levels prior to breeding in December, followed by raising to normal levels may also play an important role in stimulating breeding behavior. So, some other concerns. Deliveries can get lost. FedEx has failed on multiple deliveries of live animals. Luckily, nothing ever died. They just took an extra day to get where they were going. Packaging errors. Uh, newts packed in a closed bottle technique. Basically, you use a two liter soda bottle and fill it 100% full with water and the animals. Uh, that way, there's no jostling around. There's no air bubbles to, to make everything get bumped around. But uh, if they're fully sealed like that, it can exhaust you the CO in a hurry. So water quality. The newts are pretty hardy, but sudden chlorine spike or equipment failure can cause catastrophic failure in your animal survival. Cannibalism. Newts will kill and maim each other. If one animal in a tank grows faster than the others, there's probably a reason for that. There's less others. Uh -huh. So we move it out. We try to uh, keep... We keep all of our newts separated based on genetic line, but uh, additionally, we'll move animals around based on size a little bit as well, keeping the genetic lines separated at the same time. So once they reach about one inch total length, they can typically eat black worms and leave each other alone. You can throw a ton of black worms in their tank, and uh, they don't typically eat each other anymore. So non-native introductions, uh, we feed out black worms, like I said. We also keep some other non-native plants in their tanks, so we have to make sure that we sh none of those go in the shipment with them when we send them out. We don't want to be responsible for any non-native introduction. Um, animals get older. They typically don't breed as well. Some of them will have difficulty swimming. So I have one, one old newt tank, my retirement home for newts, uh, that's uh, very shallow and full of plants, live plants and moss that the newts can come out and just do their thing and just live out the day. And then of course the low fertility. <clears throat> so we try to move animals around to get as much genetic diversity as possible. So we're a zoo, space and funding is limited. Uh, wild animals, uh, this is one of the big problems I mentioned, I, I told you we'd be getting to earlier. We had some uh, animals that came in in 2016 some wild newts from the ANF, and uh, within about uh, 10 days, less than two weeks, after they cleared quarantine with no obvious problems, we started losing animals. So we obviously hatched out a bunch of a bunch of babies while they were in quarantine, but uh, we didn't have the equipment there to to raise them properly. So we still had some losses there. So. Again, we, 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 to we totaled about a 65% loss completely that year. It was really rough. And again, none of these concerns were discovered during necropsies on quarantined animals. 
We lost a couple during quarantine, but um, it was a rough time. So here's a newt with some uh, swelling on his uh, lower jaw. It's actually a tumor. Here's one of the newts that uh, died from that disease outbreak. I don't know if my mouse shows up here or not. You can actually see this little lesion here. And again, looks similar to that to the lesions we were seeing on the animals in the wild. There's another lesion here and up here on the back. So definitely, definitely not good. Um, and before I get too far away, because again, this isn't my most recent um, presentation, we did discover that uh, the animals that came in from the Apalachicola National Forest in 2016, they actually were positive for um, mycobacteria and ciliated protozoans. Nothing that we typically test for in quarantine, nothing that showed up on the necropsies of animals that died in quarantine, but um, even though it's the larvae, but stuff that started showing up in our animals 10 days after they exited quarantine. And only in the two enclosures that they went to, I've got two systems that they went into. We have three total strike newt systems at the Jacksonville Zoo, and two of them received these animals from the ANF. Those two experienced the catastrophic failures I was mentioning. So breeding enclosures for these animals are pretty minimalistic. We use a floating piece of cork bark that's almost never used, and some plants. There you go. But uh, pretty minimal. And uh, new plants are cycled in on a weekly basis because they lay their eggs on these plastic plants. So there you go, some of the plants we use. That's what we do with them once we uh, get them out. And there you can see the plants in the deli cup full of eggs. And again, let me see, there we go. Right here on the uh, kind of this most rightmost egg here. That's actually an almost developed larvae. That's about a five day old larvae. So about once a week, we cycle them out because that's about how long seven to nine days is typically your hatch up. <coughs> and I apologize, I'm getting over bronchitis. So larvae are kept similarly to the adults. Live java moss is used. It provides excellent cover and to keep them from eating each other. We use cork bark for the newts to begin to metamorphosize. And we use small media bags over the overflow to prevent larval loss down the overflow systems. It's important to note that larvae are grouped together by size and lineage. I mentioned that earlier. So overcrowding can quickly become a problem. We try not to house more than 50 larvae per tank. And then once they start to grow, we usually have to start moving animals around again. And then again, after two to three months, uh, cannibalism chances decrease considerably, and my life gets less stressful. Here's some ubiquitous baby pictures because who doesn't like seeing baby pictures? There's an almost hatched striped newt. There's a bunch of striped newts, and uh, right after this picture was taken, this guy was moved out. The guy in the middle back here because he's eating a black worm now, which is what I want him to do. But he's also a lot bigger than uh, a lot of his brothers and sisters. And then some of the uh, metamorphs using the pork. So many mouths to feed. Newly hatched larvae survive on a yolk sac for several days. At such a small size, they're fed hatchling brine shrimp almost exclusively for the first week. But uh, it typically ends up being two to three weeks that I continue to feed them brine shrimp. And that's they're fed out two to three times a week, typically more often. Brine shrimp are hatched out in these just brine shrimp hatcheries. You can get them on Amazon or all other places. And then I bring them out through the brine shrimp net there, um, fun system, and uh, feed them out. I rinse the I rinse the brine shrimp before feeding, and then put them in there. We'll also add some chopped black worms. After chopping, a lot of the worms begin to generate because of the worms. So the new growth that the worms start to regenerate are thinner than the original worm and perfect for young newts. They'll actually grab hold of the whiskey little new growth and rip and tear them right off of those the worm. It sucks to be a worm. The larvae, larvae are fed two to three times a week. You see some black worms about to get chopped. 
after four, six weeks, they're typically large enough to eat the whole black ones. <clears throat> so packing and shipping can be difficult, especially if what you're packing also be there. Uh, that means the closed bottle technique I mentioned earlier is right out the window. So, when we physically transport the Strike News, because it's only a three hour drive from Jacksonville to the Apalachicola National Forest, we use three to four mil fish shipping bags, double bagged in a cooler or other waterproof container. We'll pack up to 200 animals in one bag. They're only in there for a few hours, like I said, about three hour trip, and then another couple hours until we can release all of them. When we ship, however, we'll try to have equal parts air and water and only put 25 to 50 newts per bag. We keep the water shallow. That also keeps our shipping cost a little bit lower because they base it on weight. So shipping has other, let's call them hurdles. FedEx, for example, has very strict requirements for live animal shipments, especially aquatics. So they require a minimum 4 mil poly bag, a 4 mil bag, a double bag inside of another bag. So basically three bags. One and a half pounds of absorbent material for every one gallon of water. Newspaper works. That's a lot of newspaper. Polystyrene container, basically a, a big, heavy styrofoam container inside of a heavy-duty cardboard box. The box must have a minimum 275-pound burst strength per side. It mustn't leak when tipped and must have live fish labeled clearly on all sides, even if they're amphibian. So, it, they can send it back if you don't meet any of these criteria, and they will. So here's a typical newt release shipment. Handful of newts. <clears throat> and there's Ryan Means, the man himself, in one of these wetlands. And this, I believe, was a February out there. Uh, we hadn't had a ton of rain, so this is one of the, the lined wetlands. There is a rubber liner under all of this, but uh, he's standing right in the middle, and it's only about knee deep, like right in the middle there, and it's maybe 30 feet across, but it will not dry unless it gets really hot, so not so much in the winter. Post-release strike new. So in 2013, our first release, we released larval newts, and they were put in these predator avoidance tents. That didn't work out because they just managed to escape. They're pretty small, and they're good at escaping. So there's, they tried some larger pens that were completely mo mobile. They could completely lift them in and out of the water. <clears throat> but um, still, some of the newts escaped. They found little holes um, and managed to get out. So now we just do this. There you go. Good luck. And then this is a newt that was caught in one of the pitfall traps. They have these sponges they put in there, so anything that's uh, not aquatic can climb out. So getting on to some of the results. Between 2012 and 2013, we hatched out 247 larvae. That's a pretty good start for the first year. Uh, we released 58 back to the a and We kept a bunch and then they only caught three leaving the one wetland that they released them in so not huge results in 2014 heavy rains inundated the drift fences those are those pictures i showed you earlier uh, rendering them inoperable however between us and memphis we released a total of 433 back to the a and Towards the end of 2014, one of the release ponds had proceeded enough to utilize the drift fence and the pitfall traps. They had 34.5% uh, of what they released captured in the drift fences. So, still huge. Overall, out of the four ponds that received striped newts that year, it was only 7.4%. The number may well have been higher, but the flooding made it impossible to tell. Memphis sent 20 of their newts to, to Lowry Park for assistance with the repatriation program. And Jacksonville sent an additional uh, three pairs, six newts, to the Orient Society in Central Florida Zoo. 2015, we released 147 mature offspring. 
in 2014 back to the ANF. and And uh, the first returning striped newt was found in one of the traps around the drift fence. So huge news, big year. 2015 also marked an interesting discovery. Some of the holdover newts began breeding as early as eight months of age. That was fast. I, even I didn't see that one coming. We sent an additional 381 newt larvae to the ANF for release in 2015 to older larvae. <clears throat> we released between us and Memphis almost 700 newts that year. Huge, huge year. Uh, 23 newts were captured in pitfall traps at the drift fence. One was initially captured climbing the drift fence. So, again, how effective are these drift fences at catching newts? Not really sure. We may have a lot more newts getting out back up into the wild uh, than we than we think. So initially, two additional wetlands were chosen for repatriation, bringing the total number to six. Because again, with that many newts released that year, we decided, why put them all in just four baskets? Why not six? And then Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens applied for and received the AZAC, American Association of Zookeepers, Conservation, Restoration, and Preservation Grant that allows us, allowed us to expand our holding space. Here's that returning newt. So in January, we released, in 2016, sorry, we released uh, 114 back to the Apalachicola National Forest. These were the first ones that were tagged with the VIE tagging. This is when we decided, let's just release adults. <coughs> so we released another 26 later that year and uh, hatched out a total of almost 370 in 2016. So a pretty decent year, but we started, our older newts started getting older and, and weren't producing as much. Uh, many of our newts now are in their late teens, so 16, 17 years old, and likely beyond their typical reproductive cycle. So a lot of newts were found in the wetlands via dip netting. They may have uh, moved in before the fences were reconstructed and uh, pre represents a possible larger number. Initial dip net surveys conducted immediately after new releases yield surprisingly low capture data, less than 10% six hours post-release. Basically, if we release 100 newts in a wetland, within six hours, we catch less than 10 dip netting, looking for them. And we know they're not being eaten, because they're adult newts and there's no predators out there that should be large enough to take down an adult newt. So yeah, it's crazy how well they can hide and not be captured. So seven marked newts were recaptured using visual survey techniques at two months post-release at one of the sites. So really promising data. On the 6th of April in 2016, Ryan Means found three adult aquatic striped newts at the last historic pond known to have them, one that we did not release striped newts at. The last time they were found was in 2007, and it was presumed that these were wild surviving newts, that whatever had happened to the population, these newts survived. So 2017, the good, why not start with that? Another rack of enclosures was set up. This is the one we got from the grant. Uh, it almost doubled our holding space for larval rearing. <clears throat> several additional newts were found at that historic wetland I just mentioned, including several larvae. 2.5 were sent to Jacksonville. Wild populations of, new of newts were found in other historic wetlands as well, outside of the Apalachicola National Forest. So after we basically just doubled, tripled, quadrupled down on all of our efforts with Florida Fish and Wildlife, USGS. Everybody started looking around these historic wetlands to see if they could really try to find any surviving remaining newts. So we released almost 80 adults and an additional 34 were released from Central Florida Zoo that they produced. Because we found these wild newts, all these agencies all of a sudden said, hey, what's going on? And we got a lot more interest in this Stripe New program. So we decided to form the Stripe New Working Group, 
It's a combination of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, USDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, private landowners, zoos and aquariums, uh, all these other nonprofit and non-government organizations. Everybody sits down typically once a year and goes over plans and, and tries to figure out what's going on, updates on news from the field, news from captivity, etc. So an additional 2.1 wild news from this wetland were sent to Jacksonville for future breeding. But not so good. Three of the wild striped newts died during quarantine at Jacksonville. as the ones I had mentioned before. The ones that we found nothing obvious on the uh, necropsies. The same newts likely arrive with ciliated protozoans and mycobacteria. We suffered a rapid, rapid and significant decline of F1 generation animals. Original Georgia source breeders were unaffected. That's that third rack I mentioned, that third system that received none of these newts in the wild. So I put further releases in question. <clears throat> Those further releases were eventually green lighted because it was basically just proven that there's just no way that these animals did not come in with these problems. So the hydro period within the ANF in 2018 was in a poor state until late spring rain. Preparing for our first release, now this is again 2018, we released uh, 44 animals in 2018. Uh, we continued to lose animals in 2018, though most of the original issues appears to have passed or reached an equilibrium. We lost another 1.1 ANF adults, those are the last news that we lost. So we keep uh, 2.3 Appalachian National Forest adult news. Most of the captive larvae produced the Jacksonville from the wild ANF newts, over 150, as well as 35 Georgia source larval newts. That we, okay, we released 46 back to ANF. Um, so all of the newts reproduced in 2018 were released back to the wild. And 2019, actually, in after after breeding season in 2018, I apologize because that's the last time this one was updated. After that release in 2018 and uh, breeding season was over, I decided to do, basically do a Hail Mary pass and try to eliminate whatever this disease process was once and for all. We tried treating the newts. Um, we dumped, I don't know how many gallons of metronidazole into the tanks to try to cure them of their uh, ciliated protozoal infections. And yeah, nothing seemed to help. No treatment helped. We kind of let it run its course and it may have just run its course and left. That wasn't good enough for me. So I convinced all of the newts that I had, all of them that were adults, to completely metamorphose or completely go to a terrestrial state, move them out of their enclosures into separate um, clean terrestrial enclosures for a month while I completely disassembled and disinfected their systems. So I had to start everything from scratch, but I completely disassembled, completely disinfected, and dried their systems before I put them all back together and started all over again. So at this point, there should no longer be any hydrological issues within my systems, um, unless some of the newts just are carriers now. But I was hoping by breaking that aquatic cycle, the aquatic life cycle of these animals, that these pathogens, that uh, it would hopefully negate any problems. Uh, the results this year have been promising. In 2019, we hatched out about 550 newts, which is getting back up there into really big numbers. A lot of these were Appalachian National Forest striped newts. We kept a couple of the of the, the offspring that we produced in 2018 from Appalachia National Forest for some additional genetics. And uh, again, had a really big year this year and, and looked to release somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 striped newts uh, this winter. So great news. <clears throat> so additional institutional involvement, um, Central Florida Zoo and Orient Center for Indigo Conservation has been uh, participants for several years. Um, 
they uh, had 2.2 Georgia source animals left, and in 2018 at least had 270 offspring produced. And then another area that I mentioned uh, that was found was Dixie Plantation. And uh, they had 4.3 animals from there that they got for this program, and approximately 50 larvae. Um, they had some similar health issues and survivability issues as the ANF animals did at, at Jacksonville, and uh, I've partnered with them to try to help them get over those hurdles, and right now I think their populations are stable. Memphis Zoo, they originally they were one of the founders of this project. They had the original groups of Georgia source newts. They lost all of these newts due to a mysterious disease outbreak, similar to what happened to us. And um, they didn't have many animals left by the time they were trying to, to figure out what was going on, and unfortunately just lost all of them. So they did a fantastic job for many years, but uh, are currently not involved in the project. Detroit Zoo, they've got uh, seven Georgia source newts and 58 of their offspring, and uh, 11 Dixie plantation newts and 10 larvae. As of 2018, I don't have the 2019 information. The Amphibian Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia, has uh, four Georgia source newts and nine Dixie plantation, and in 2018 had around 100 uh, Dixie plantation newts that had hatched out. So they were releasing animals back in 2018. And then Lowry Park has eight Georgia source newts, although none have produced yet. I think I skipped a slide. Hang on. No, I didn't. Never mind. So I'm wrapping this up now, which is good because I'm right on time. Uh, the Stripe New Project is a really interesting collaboration between several facilities as well as state and federal governments. It didn't happen overnight, and technically it's still happening. Several years of research had to occur before steps could be taken to work towards this. To get involved, find local researchers, partner with co colleges, and apply for grants to fund studies. Spread the word and share the knowledge. Many zoo guests don't even know what a newt is. It's my job to show them. So get local schools involved, either at your facility or in the field, or both. And get as much organizational involvement as possible. Get your coworkers out there, assist with releases, monitoring, construction, etc. So this is some schools out there, dip netting or dip netting and checking out what's in these pitfall traps. Uh, this is Rebecca Means, Ryan Means' wife and, and fellow ecologist, out there teaching class. Some of the next generation of scientists. This is the front view of my building, my, my area where I work with these striped newts. And uh, we talk about them. Um, you can see there's striped newt signage missing, but I've got one right in there. And we're actually getting some um, uh, televised signs, some digital signage coming up this year. And this is some herpetology crew and horticulture crew from Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens out there in the field helping with drip fence installation. Again, get as much of your institutional institution involved as possible. All your colleagues, uh, let them know what's going on. Who doesn't love a field trip anyway, right? So, and again, I'm, I'm thankful to a lot of places. Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens has provided Tremendous opportunities for, for not only me, but several conservation programs that I work with, not even mentioning all the other conservation programs we work with and fund. <clears throat> all these other folks on here. There you go, if you want to see the prettier pictures. And um, that's pretty much it for me.